Hello everybody. Today we're going to be talking about how orbitals are shaped. It's important for chemists to understand the shapes of orbitals because covalent chemical bonds are the result of the sharing of electrons that reside in these orbitals. The shape of an orbital is determined mainly by L, the angular momentum quantum number, also called the azimuthal quantum number. If you don't know much about quantum numbers, I suggest you check out my video on orbitals and quantum numbers since this knowledge is kind of a prerequisite for understanding the content of this video. Values of the azimuthal quantum number are assigned the letters S, P, D, and F for L values of 0, 1, 2, and 3, respectively. Now before we get into the specific shapes, let's just go ahead and remind ourselves what an orbital actually is, because it's very easy for us to climb deep down into the rabbit hole without truly understanding anything about what we're talking about. The orbital is a three-dimensional plot of the wave function of the electron squared. The wave function psi is a super complicated mathematical function that describes the wave-like behavior of the electron, and it's derived by solving the Schrodinger equation for the atom of interest. To put it in the simplest way possible without omitting any necessary information, the orbital is basically just a region of space where an electron is most likely to be found. And it's much more useful to us than trying to pinpoint the exact location of the electron because the more we know about the electron's location, the less we know about the energy of the electron, which is a very very, very important property. So let's get into the shapes, starting with the shapes of the s orbitals. The magnitude of psi squared represents probability density, which is the probability per unit volume of finding an electron at a given point in space. In this image, the orbital is portrayed such that the more heavily shaded regions have a larger probability density, which means that there's a higher likelihood of finding the electron there. As you can see, the s orbital is spherical. It can also be portrayed as a sphere that has no heavily shaded or lightly shaded regions under the assumption that the volume encompassed by the sphere has a 90% probability of containing the electron. If we take a look at a plot of the probability density versus the distance from the nucleus, which we'll call r, we can see that the further away you go from the nucleus, the less likely you are to find the electron. It seems logical, but it tends to imply that the most likely place to find the electron is at the nucleus, and that's not true at all. We can get a better idea by looking at the electron's radial distribution function, which is a plot of the actual probability, not probability density, just plain old probability, of finding the electron within a thin spherical shell at a distance r from the nucleus. We can better understand the radial distribution function by thinking of the space around the nucleus of an atom as a jawbreaker. What we're looking at with this function is the probability of an electron existing within a single layer of the jawbreaker, not the volume encompassed by that layer, but in the actual thin layer itself. So here's what it looks like. Notice that the radial distribution function has a value of zero at the nucleus, because it's impossible for the electron to be existing in the exact same space as the nucleus, and it also has a maximum probability at a radius of 52.9 picometers. After that, the probability decreases with an increasing distance from the nucleus. The shape of the curve is what it is because the total electron probability is obtained by multiplying two terms, the probability density and the volume of the spherical shell at a given radius. As r increases, the probability density decreases, but the volume of the spherical shell increases. At the nucleus, the probability density is at a maximum, but the volume of the spherical shell is zero, so the radial distribution function is zero. Near the nucleus, the volume of the spherical shell increases faster than the decrease in probability density, and so the radial distribution function starts to climb upward. But once we get past 52.9 picometers, however, the probability density falls off faster than the volume increases, and so we have a decrease from there on out in the radial distribution function. Let's take a look at the s orbitals that are in the second and third principal energy levels, the 2s and 3s orbitals. Just like the 1s orbital, the 2s and 3s orbitals are spherical, but unlike the 1s orbital, these higher energy orbitals have gaps in them. These gaps are called nodes. Nodes are regions of space where the wave function, and therefore the square of the wave function that we call the orbital, pass through zero. There is zero probability of finding the electron in a node. But why do nodes exist? Nodes exist because of standing waves, which are formed when waves propagate in opposite directions and interfere with one another. Let's take a look at a two-dimensional standing wave. When two waves of equal frequency propagate in opposite directions, there are regions where they constructively interfere, that is to say they build one another up, and these are called antinodes. 
And then there are regions of space where they destructively interfere, which means that they cancel one another out, resulting in an amplitude of zero. These are the nodes. So these orbitals are basically just three-dimensional standing waves. Let's take a look at the p orbitals, which exist in the second principal energy level and beyond. Notice that the two p orbitals shown here are not spherically symmetrical like the s orbitals. Instead, each p orbital has two lobes of electron density, one on either side of the nucleus, and a node at the nucleus. The three p orbitals are indistinguishable from one another, and only differ in their orientation. Notice that the p orbitals are orthogonal, which means that they are mutually perpendicular, so oftentimes they'll be shown as oriented along the x, y, and z axes, and will be given the names px, py, and pz. p orbitals in higher principal levels have roughly the same shapes as the 2p orbitals, but they're larger in size and they have more nodes. Let's take a look at the d orbitals, which are found in the third principal level and beyond. Four of the five d orbitals are shaped like clover leaves and have four lobes of electron density around the nucleus and two perpendicular nodal planes. In my opinion, the most interesting d orbital is the d z squared orbital, which has two lobes oriented along the z axis and a donut shaped ring along the x y plane. d orbitals in higher principal levels have roughly the same shape as the three d orbitals, however they are larger and they do have more nodes. And finally, let's turn our attention to the f orbitals, which are found in the fourth principal shell and beyond. By now you can probably see the pattern here, that as the azimuthal quantum number increases from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3, in other words s orbitals, p orbitals, d orbitals, and f orbitals, we get more and more complicated orbitals that have progressively more lobes and progressively more nodes. Now these f orbitals are very poorly drawn due to the limitations of my software, so I suggest you check out your chemistry textbook to see what they really look like. So now you know how the orbitals are shaped, but how are atoms shaped? Well you've probably seen the classic ball and stick model of a molecule which shows the atoms as spheres, and as it turns out this is a pretty good description of what an atom really looks like. The shape of an atom is simply the shapes of its orbitals superimposed on top of one another. So we've got the s orbitals, the p orbitals, the d orbitals, and so on just jumbled together, and so the atom assumes a shape that is roughly spherical. That's it! This video, like most of my videos, is brought to you by hard work caffeine, and sheer perfectionism. Thank you very much for watching, and have a great one.